So I'm going to stay on the science theme, but move you into from, um, from the sort of building blocks of, of materials atoms to the building blocks of human beings, cells. Um, and I'm a, I'm a rheumatologist by training. I'm a physician and I work here. Some of you may have not been up the hill, but that's the Nuffield Orthopaedic Centre. And that's the new building that the architect designed so that when you looked at it from a helicopter, it looks like a hip replacement. <laughs> there you go. That's a, a good use of public money. <laughs> um, and then this is some of our local artwork. And, and this is the building I'm based in, um, the uh, Botner Research Centre, which is just across the car park. So it's a, real, it's a really nice opportunity. And I'm, um, I'm very privileged in that I've, I've been given a buyout from my time at the hospital to go and look at some of the questions underlying some of these diseases in the lab. And that's, um, and for me, that's like playtime, really. It's really fun, and it's, it's, um, it's been a really nice opportunity. But this is the disease I see, and this is the, these are the patients I treat in the hospital, and it's a disease called ankylosing spondylitis. I don't know if any of you have heard of this, but this is the same individual photographed over um, a period of about 25 years. And as the disease progresses, you get this very... Uh, um, uh, sort of signature phenotype where the disease affects the spine and the spine begins to uh, become inflamed and then as it tries to heal fuses and then becomes immobile and so this is what it looks like on an x-ray phrase is a bamboo spine these are, should be individual vertebrae but they fuse together but you also get inflammation at the sacroiliac joints right at the back here and the patients pre present with back pain um, you get inflammation where tendons attach to bone, so the Achilles is a site. But as well as um, inflammation in the bone, sorry about the gory pictures. The, you know, but if you come to a medicine talk, you should see some gory <laughs> pictures. <laughs> um, you get inflammation in the gut, the eyes, uh, and also inflammation in the skin. Not everybody, but these are, these are the patterns we see. Um, and so genetics has helped us a lot. This is called the Manhattan plot. And it really is called a Manhattan plot because it resembles the Manhattan skyline, or someone thought it might do. But essentially, we can do these um, genome-wide association studies to look for genetic markers that might predispose to disease. And when we do that, a lot of these genes that predispose to... There's not one gene, there are multiple genes. Um, so each gene gives, increases your risk of developing this disease slightly. But all of these genes seem to point towards a particular type of immune cell called a T-cell. So what's a T cell? This is my basic guide to the immune system. Um, so you have two different types of immunity. You have something called innate immunity. This is, um, these are cells that are um, they're not particularly sophisticated. They see patterns of bacteria and they respond by just bashing them. They're sort of like riot police. They're not really sophisticated. They just run, they charge with their batons and charge and bash everything. And then you have these more sophisticated immune cells, the uh, T cells and the B cells. And these have a, a very um, specific receptor that can pick out um, very, uh, um, very unique structures uh, specific to bacteria and viruses and induce a, a more um, subtle immune response that wipes them out, um, even often before you um, develop disease. So these are the cells that are responsible the vaccinations and these are the cells that give the immune system its memory and the cell I'm interested in is this CD4 T cell and as we begin to uh, understand this cell we begin to um, so immunologists like to sort of split things every, every now and then some, someone comes along discovers a new molecule and looks uh, the immune system and says where is it expressed uh, some of these T cells have it and others don't so we divide them and say these are a different type of T cell to that type of cell. So these are called T helper cells, and there are at least, uh, you know, about every year there's a publication in, in one of the big journals where they predict a new type of T cell. Um, and we like to divide them, and in, in, in the textbooks we like to say, okay, this is a T helper one cell, and it makes this particular molecule that drives the immune response. These are called cytokines. This is a T helper two cells, and it makes a different type of signal for the immune system. But actually, in reality, um, we find that these cells um, are not as unique as we'd like to think they are. They can, um, they, 
they behave differently under different um, uh, circumstances. And that's what we're trying to understand in the lab. So it's quite a simple question that we're asking. Um, how is the T cell behaving in this disease in ankylosing spondylitis? Because all the genetics is pointing there. Well, functionally, how is it behaving? What molecules is it making? And we do this with a flow cytometry approach. So Sergi has already given you the background on the visual uh, spectrum. But essentially, we, have <coughs> we can generate antibodies specific to different markers on a cell. So we take these antibodies and we literally attach a color tag to them. This is a color tag you might not be able to see by the naked eye, but if you shine a laser at a particular wavelength, you get a readout. And so you take a cell, and then you um, get your antibodies, and they bind onto it. And then, and then you can infer that there's an expression of a particular protein that way. So what you do is run the cells one at a time, and you shine the laser through them. And then if, if that uh, protein is there, you know the color of the tag, and then you can you can visualize it. So this is, this is the sort of plot you get um, where each one of these dots is a different cell uh, that you run. Luckily, the machine can run about 5,000 cells per second, so it's quite a... <laughs> so, <it's laughs> so it doesn't take long to get this sort of data. But you can start to quantify, and you can say, OK, this particular molecule on these T cells ex is expressed in 2.5% two, two of the, the cells we put in. You can start to quantify. But it, the neat thing is you can start to drill down and you say, OK, I can do, I can do up to about, on my machine up in the, I can do about 14 colors in one go. So I can say, OK, I'm going to put lots of colors in simultaneously and drill down on this population. I'm going to drill down on this population. And then interrogate each population and say, which, molecule, uh, which molecules, which inf inflammatory molecules are they expressing? And if we do that, we can see that um, this particular molecule, IL-17A, which is a molecule made by a type of T-cell, is overexpressed in the disease. So these are disease patients um, versus healthy, healthy pa uh, well, not patients, healthy people I've roped into giving me blood in the lab. <laughs> um, and, um, and this is quite useful because then we can go and try and neutralize some of these factors. Um, and this has been quite a successful approach. Um, this is just a graph showing you that uh, we can generate monoclonal antibodies um, against, so these are uh, things that bind and neutralize the inflammatory factors. And this is a clinical trial in patients where if we give, if we neutralize this particular factor from the CD4 cell, um, within six weeks we can make 60% of our patients better. Um, and that's been um, quite a successful approach. But as we understand the regulation, we can also look inside the cell. And this is some work um, we've been involved in uh, in the lab where um, we, we know that the signal inside the cell for switching on the production of this molecule um, and we can generate small molecules, to s drugs to bind to it and inhibit it. And then if we do that, and we've done that on patients so we take the blood from the patients and study it in the test tube in the lab. And this is what happens. So this up here is the IL-17A, the bad stuff. Um, and if you add your molecule in, you can reduce it by half, which is good. Because you don't want to clear... Remember, these are, um, these are mechanisms that have evolved for a reason to fight infection. So you don't want to wipe them out completely. You just want to dampen down the immune response so that it's not fighting itself but retains that ability to fight bugs. Um, and then the future, of course, is digital colouring in. Um, the problem with colouring in is that you have to stay inside the lines and you get the spillover of the visual spectrum. And after about 14 different colours, you run out of space um, because the spillover between the emission is too much. So instead of labelling your antibodies with colours now, um, the approach is to label your antibodies with um, transition metal isotopes. And then you can uh, look at 100 different markers mm -hmm. per cell. Um, and you can do... So that's... Uh, and so we've got one of these machines at the Botnar. It looks like a sort of 1970s microwave, but it's... Uh, <laughs> this is the machine. Um, but uh, and we're just 
beginning to get these working. It's been a big leap in terms of the uh, technology, uh, but we can generate much prettier pictures, I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so this is, a, th this is a whole lot of blood you put in, and then you look at the various markers, and you ask one question at a time. So you can cluster your cells according to the markers they express, and then say, OK, um, which cells are expressing a particular protein, and then they light up, and then you can do that repeatedly. Um, so I'm supported by the Wellcome Trust, and they've uh, very kindly as I bought me out of my clinical training for a few years, and it's been a hugely rewarding experience in the lab. Um, and this is my main supervisor, Paul Benes, who's been a, um, who's been a real um, inspiration. Thank you.